All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. All right. Beautiful, loud and clear. Good to go. Just want to thank everybody very much for your time in advance. It has been a pretty interesting past 24 hours in financial markets. It was uh, two o'clock yesterday that we had the FOMC rate decision rate hike. Um, the Fed did get a little bit more dovish for 2019. Now looking at two hikes versus the previous three, but this may not have been as dovish as markets were wanting the bank to have gone. Uh, that could be evidenced in a fairly brutal equity sell-off that's continued through yesterday's Fed meeting and into this morning. Uh, that does put stocks on a, on the back foot as we near the end of 2018, open up for 2019. Um, but today I wanted to take a step back, largely looking at longer term, bigger picture formations in the US dollar and around the currency. The reason for such is because of the way my next two weeks look. Um, I'm gonna be taking a little bit of vacation around the Christmas holiday. I am gonna keep my platform open, but I'm not planning on doing a whole lot on a short term basis. Largely looking at this for swing trades, position setups, things of that nature. Um, the week after brings New Year's. So we're likely going to be seeing some low liquidity conditions across markets over the next couple of weeks. And I think this can make for a really daunting environment for short-term strategy. So I'm simply going to take a step back from that. Uh, but there are a series of interesting themes. And I think this is where swing setups could become of interest. And I'm going to try to parse through those today. But as usual, this webinar is all about you. So pairs that you have or setups you want to take a look at, or even just random trading questions that might be on your mind. Fire those my way. I will do my absolute best to answer as many of those as I can when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Need to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. First and foremost, starting here, trading is risky. I'm going to give this about 10 more seconds. Then we will move on to the next disclaimer. All right, disclaimer part two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. Going to look at some past trades, going to look at some strategy. Anytime we do so, have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. All right, let's make this happen. And there we go. All right, so probably the biggest takeaway from yesterday's rate decision was the follow through impact on the US dollar. Now, initially around that rate decision, the first initial move, let's just go down to an hourly chart. There we go. That first initial move, as you can see right here at two o'clock yesterday, uh, was a move of strength. The dollar perched back up to that area of prior resistance around the 97 handle, running up to about 97.10. That strength remained through Chair Powell's press conference. You can see this at the 0300 candle. Then after he concluded, right near the equity market close, four o'clock, this is where the dollar started to top out. Now, when Asia opened its doors, that's when dollar selling really started to show. We saw a rather aggressive downside break. Prices even perched below that Fibonacci level at 96.47. Taking a step back, we could see where we touched down to a fresh monthly low right here below that big area of support that had previously held up two different uh, two different support checks earlier in December. Now, after that bounce came in, uh, right around the open of the Euro session, a little bit after, we made another attempt to get back towards that 97 figure, but you can see right here where resistance came in off an area of prior support and sellers pushed this right back down. So I've just finished writing the Q1 2019 technical forecast on USD, and I'm looking for this to break lower. I'm looking for US dollar strength to continue taking a back seat to some of these, these, these other prevailing themes. Uh, the Euro has recently become of interest again, and that's something we'll look at here in a moment. But as, as far as that longer term backdrop that I was discussing, we had this bullish trend that held through October and even the early portion of November. November is when this fresh yearly high was set at 97 spot 69. And since then, the dollar has been rather range bound as could be evidenced off this four hour chart right in here. Now, recent support has been coming in off of that Fibonacci level at 96.47. We saw an attempt to take out that high last Friday. We just barely budged up to a fresh yearly high, like two hundredths of a point higher than that previous November swing. And since then, bears have been in control. 
We saw that sell-off going into FOMC. We saw that quick retracement around the rate decision itself. But after that, after Asia opened last night, sellers have come right back to push down to that fresh monthly low. I think that there is larger scope for a deeper pullback here in the US dollar. And the area that I'm looking for prices to move towards is back towards that 94.20 Fibonacci level that had helped to set support on multiple occasions in Q3, right in there. Now, with that being said, I do think it's important to still pick the appropriate spots. This isn't something where I want to go with a full scale, uh, throw the kitchen sink at the short side of the dollar approach, because I do think there are areas that could be accommodated for dollar strength. I also think there are some areas that could be a bit more accommodated for dollar weakness. And that's what I'm going to parse through here today, looking at longer term setups on major currency pairs. So one of those areas that I think could be a big player in dollar weakness going into 2019 is right here in the euro. Now, this might have gotten lost in the shuffle given the theatrics of yesterday, but that EU Italy deal, I think, could keep the door open for some further gains in euro dollar. Now, it's been a pretty peculiar year on the pair. Uh, last year saw a surprising amount of strength show up in the pair. And this is even as the ECB was still pedaled to the floor on their QE. Now, much of this drive was coming from the prospect of a shift at the ECB, a shift that hasn't really shown up yet, a shift into a slightly more hawkish tone, which first would require the bank getting less dovish. Now, what happened in 2018 is worries around Italy started to show up. April is when, the, uh, when, when Italy had elected largely a Euro skeptic government. And that's when a bit of fear started to get priced into the equation. Prices retraced pretty quickly, 38.2% of that prior bullish move. And we made a move down towards the 50% marker, but got a bit of support before then. Now for much of the summer, Euro dollar was range bound. As those worries around Italy were still running high, but there wasn't really a strong bullish case or a strong bullish theme pricing through the US dollar as it was going back and forth as well. That Italy theme came back into the headlines late September, held throughout much of October. And this is what had helped the US dollar to show that bullish trend, that channel that we looked at just a moment ago as Euro was selling off. But from around the midpoint of the quarter, notice that's like November 12th when we set that low, more consolidation. And that's where the symmetrical triangle that we've been following comes into play. Now, this was a notable event. This was the ECB rate decision just last week. This is when the ECB finally announced an end to the bond buying program as part of their QE. Now, that gave us a quick downside test of that symmetrical triangle. But as I had warned at the time, this was not something that was attractive for Chase. Instead, I wanted to see a downside break of this big support area before I reopened that door. That never came into play. What did come into play was some additional year dollar strength. You can see that evidenced here. Prices came back above that prior symmetrical triangle, checked back for support at prior resistance, and then prices have just catapulted into that longer term resistance zone. So I'm getting warmer to the idea of Euro dollar strength, but at this point, we're still within that resistance zone and I don't have the wherewithal to be able to get long just yet. But this is one of the swing trades that I was referring to at the open of this webinar that I'm gonna be following over the Christmas holidays to see if this does start to tiptoe above that 115 psychological level that it helped to set this swing high back in November. At this point, that is the two month high. And if we take that price of 115 out, I like the idea of looking for continued gains up to the 117 handle. Now, the reason that I think Euro dollar could be somewhat attractive as we go into next year isn't because I think the ECB is gonna raise rates anytime soon. I think it's because of the simple fact that the ECB has gone less dovish while the Fed has gotten slightly more dovish, could continue playing out. Very similar to what we saw in 2017 where the euro was ripping higher even though it was the Fed that was hiking rates. But before I wanna even entertain that option, I wanna see a topside break of this 115 handle that had given a really strong swing high back here in early November. Taking a step back, looking at the daily chart, there we go. That's what I wanna see taken out first before I could look for a move back up to there. Pretty interesting setup as we go into 2019.
I like it. Uh, so Pete, slightly different view than what I have right here, but he says as futures are bleeding into stocks. And as I said during the presser, I wasn't buying that greenback, uh, that, that, that dollar rally. I think I'll finger trap my way into the new year. I like it, my friend. I like it. If I had a bit more time, I'd probably be doing something similar. But holidays, got family in town. Got to adjust, got to adapt. So for right now, I'd be very, very careful in this zone that runs between 1448, 15 flat. Topside break above starts to reopen the door for topside sets, bullish strategies. Depending on the way that that breakout happens or that test happens, that's going to determine how I'm going to be able to go into or work with that move. Ideally, I would let prices break out and run for a bit, maybe catching a bit of resistance off of this swing around 15 and a half, at which point I could look to play a pullback with support at prior resistance, whether that be at 1485, 15 flat, what have you. But I think this could be a pretty interesting one to watch for 2019 because that big wet blanket of fear around Italian politics, I mean, now there's a reason to fade that out. So this one is considerably more messy, especially considering just two weeks into the new year is when we're expected to see that Brexit vote in UK Parliament. And there was a rate decision this morning out of the Bank of England. They cut growth forecasts slightly for next year, inflation forecasts as well. Now, just last week, just last week, cable was bleeding on those Brexit headlines and eventually brought the 125 level into, into play, breaking through a really big support level at 126.71. 126.71 is the 23.6 retracement of the Brexit move in the pair. It's did a great job of setting the yearly low for like three months after the support hit in mid-August. Mid now, this came back into play in early December, hoping to hold the lows, but that tide of selling pressure just was not able to hold as Theresa May had announced that she was going to delay or postpone the Brexit vote. That's what led to this downside break and this capitulation down to 125. Now, at that point, I started to look for resistance of prior support off that 2671 level, and that held for a few different occasions. But each of those runs was getting a bit less pull, as indicated by the higher lows as shown off this bullish trend line. That bullish trend line came back into play again this morning. And it looks as though buyers are going to soon start tiptoeing above this high. Notice where these higher highs are coming in just slightly higher than the prior one. It's a good signal that bears aren't as aggressive as they had been or as they were. They're taking a slight step back while bulls are pushing just a little bit more. The next level that I want to look to come into play is at 127.50, but I don't know if I'm going to be bearish on that move if it does come into play, especially given this pattern of recent higher lows that are now being accompanied with some slightly higher highs. Now, to, to co-opt that strategy or that, that outlook or that approach that I used on Euro dollar, what I'd want to see here is a top side push up to that 2750 handle, at which point I look to play a playback to support a prior resistance. This area right around the, the 127 highs appears like it could be pretty attractive for as such. Right in there. I'd even be willing to accept something to pull back as deep as about 2671. But as long as this bullish trend line remains in play, I think this is something that could be worked with. And just the fact that there are still so many folks that appear to be trying to sell the uh, sell sterling on the back of Brexit dynamics. I mean, it feels like that story is at least taking a pause for right now. Um, now, coming into the new year, again, Brexit is likely going to remain center stage. That parliamentary vote is due, I believe it's the second week of January, January 14th. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. But going into year end, bulls haven't yet shown a sign of relenting as we're starting to just wedge our way above that 2671 Fibonacci level. Next move I want to look for is up to 2750. What happens after that is going to be telling us to how I can proceed. All right, this is another dollar weakness setup that I have. And this is a good example as to why I like to keep at least one portion of a lot open for an open profit target. I had started to set this one up for USD weakness last week. 
largely looking for a continuation of these lower highs that have been printing for about the past few months to continue lower. Now, my initial target was right here around 112.30, a big support level in the pair. My secondary target, the last target that I had listed is right here, 111.60, 111.64 to be exact. But buyers have been unable to hold this thing up and prices have just continued to crash lower. Crash might be hyperbolic, but let's call it crushed lower. Uh, so now taking a look at the daily, the fear is the move may have already juiced most of what's left or most of what was there. And it does start to take on an oversold type of tonality. Um, but with that said, we've broken below this bullish channel that's been in play for about the past seven months. And I want to keep the door open for continuation setups. So what that means is a pullback to resistance of prior support could start to become an attractive thesis to work with. Um, 111.64 didn't really show a ton of support when prices were on the way down. We did get some intraday support right here. This could be evidenced off the hourly chart. A pullback to that level, I'm going to have to get a bit more creative with where I'm going to place my stops because there aren't a lot of good resistance swings here. And going all the way above 112.65 just seems like it'd be a little bit too rich, adding, giving it a little bit too much room. Uh, if we do see a deeper retracement that comes back up towards that 112 handle, well, that's where this swing around 112.66, 112.70 could start to come into play for stop placement. But I'm going to keep this on the short side of the dollar in the interim until something here changes. And I don't have any evidence that that's anywhere nearby. Uh, on the deeper areas of support, 110.86 is a big level. That's a 61.8% retracement that is related to the 764 retracement. And then around that 110 handle, you can even run that down to one uh, from 110 to 109666, which is the 50% marker of that same major move. You want to get that major move on your charts? It's just simply looking at this the November 2017 high down to the March 2018 low. And so far this year, or for the bulk of this year, that Fibonacci retracement has done a pretty good job of helping to catch support and resistance, even on a short term basis. All right, so we've looked at three short side USD setups. Let's look at one on the other side of the equation, dollar CAD. So I had mentioned on Tuesday to be careful of dollar CAD because of that 135 level. And 135 did a pretty good job of holding resistance yesterday, but we have just barely squeaked above. And I do have trepidation about chasing up in these regions. Uh, now I'd also drawn attention to this support level in dollar CAD. Uh, on Tuesday, this came into play yesterday. Uh, decent area of prior resistance, a Fibonacci level, a 786 Fibonacci level. This related to the 618 Fibonacci level that did a pretty good job of helping to catch the swing low back in mid-November. At this point, the pair does feel overbought, especially on a near-term basis. But on a longer-term basis, this does remain as one of the more attractive candidates to look to or to use for long USD continuation. What I need here at this point is a pullback. Uh, this bullish trend line has been in place since early October. We did get one breach below that in early December, but prices soon came back above, found some follow through support. So I still consider this as a valid trend line, even though we did have that check below, temporary check below the last for about two days. But what I could do from here is get a little bit more creative with areas that I'd be able to look for uh, higher low support. Notice that trend line begins to get confluent with that 3423 Fibonacci level. I'm also going to add in the 764, which comes in around 3385. So even if we test below that trend line again, but I see support holding around that 3385 handle, keeps the door open for stops below that prior swing low around 3320, 3318 to look for bullish continuation. But this is put in a sparkling trend. It does feel a bit overbought. We're trading over a big psychological level at the moment of 135. This seems like it could be a very, very difficult area to be chasing a pair higher, right up there. All right, so getting back on the short side of the dollar, and then uh, and then we'll close by looking at a couple of long USD setups. Uh, dollar Swiss. This has been a pretty interesting one for me in Q4, and to a larger part, even going back before that. Um, but it was a a little over a month ago that I started to look for reversal setups in the pair as prices were com coming up to 
tests some resistance that's traditionally been a pretty difficult area for dollar Swiss bulls. Right between that expanse of the 764 and the 786 Fibonacci retracements. Now, I had set a stop just above 10150. This thing topped out at 10130. And then we started to see bears beginning to come back into play mid November and thereafter. The big level of interest for me on this pair is that parity swing. Notice where parity had done a great job holding the highs here for about two weeks, week and a half before bears are finally able to push down to fresh lows. Now this support swing at 98.57, it's pretty legit. We've seen a higher low build off of that level, but as you can see here, bears, they're not yet done. So I'm gonna keep this on the short side of the ledger as we have had this build of lower highs. And if we do see a grander move of USD weakness, and I think this is something that could play out in a pretty interesting fashion. So both dollar yen, dollar Swiss, I want to point out, um, I'm looking for that dollar weakness against areas of risk aversion. Looking for franc strength, looking for yen strength. I think this is something that could correlate pretty well with the continued sell-off in the equity space. All right, and the final two, starting off with Aussie. So Aussie dollar has had a really rough 2018. We topped out here in January. We spent the next nine months holding resistance below a very bearish trend line. Now it was October that I started to try to look for lows or support. As it appeared as though that short side momentum was beginning to slow down. We saw this build of support above the 70 big figure. I even asked right here whether or not that was capitulation. And then as November rolled around and as a bit of USD weakness began to show, this thing was ready to fly. And it did. And it remained fairly strong even going into December. Right in there, December 4th, that's when we topped out just underneath the 74 handle. But as we looked at last week, prices made a beeline for this big support zone that runs between 7185, 7206, and it built into a bear flag formation. And then as that dollar strength showed up last Friday, this thing took a turn for the worst, down to a fresh two month low. And as I looked at on Tuesday, we were catching resistance at that area, that big area of prior support. Now, what makes this really interesting is that even with that oncoming of dollar weakness that we saw around the Asian open yesterday, Aussie has retained a fairly bearish state. Fresh lower low, print below 71 around FOMC. The pullback that came from that dollar weakness just merely got us up to a support test, excuse me, a resistance test at prior support. So this remains interesting as one of the, uh, or one of the more interesting long USD setups that I have on my radar right now. Uh, the big question that I have is what happens after 70. I do think this next run might get a little bit of turbulence on the way, but I do think this next run will bring that 70 big figure into play. But I don't know if it has the wherewithal to be able to break through yet. This might be something where we have to reload into the end of the year before there is going to be enough selling pressure to finally break through and leave that level behind. But the price action here has been undeniable, even with those dollar dynamics over the past 24 hours. All right, somewhat of a similar story here on Kiwi. After spending most of the year in a fairly bearish state, showing that dollar strength very, very visibly, October started to bring some softening around the lows, a bit less of that bearish motivation. Late October, you see where we got this higher low. And then as the door opened in November, this thing was ready to rip, and it did. Continue putting in higher highs and higher lows. There's a couple of big zones that came into play here. This area between 68, 70, 68, 77, that's a big area, two long-term Fibonacci levels. And it did a decent job of holding these lows for about a week until sellers eventually had their way, fresh lower low, and then we came up, just like we looked at on Tuesday, resistance at that prior support zone, and then bears have taken it away. Now, as I'd also said on Tuesday, this is one that could cut either way, right? And the fact that if I did see some support hang at the 6820 area, then I'd have the door open for higher low support, looking for a reversion to those prior highs around 69 or thereafter. That hasn't happened. This thing's continued to fold lower. 
And at this point, if we look at this on like the two hour chart, it takes on a very similar tonality as what we saw in Aussie, where we caught that resistance at that area of prior support after a fresh lower low. I think this thing could continue to unfold. And I think this does remain as one of the more attractive long USD candidates as we go into next year. All right, because time is of concern, I'm gonna start looking to see what markets you folks are asking about. Oh, wow. Folks want to talk about the stocks. All right, equities. So it's pretty nasty out there right now. Um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average purging down to a fresh yearly low. We're with, you know, 10 days until the end of the year. Um, I don't have a lot that I can do with this. I don't have any nearby support swings that I could use to base reversal setups. And it also feels as though it's a bit, uh, as that theme of weakness might be a bit overplayed at this point. Um, also, a vexing prospect is where to play stops, right? That recent swing that I have up here is like 23,410. Uh, that'd be just about 500 points for a stop. That's too rich for my blood. I need to be able to look for about 600 or 700 upside to make that worth my while. Um, so for this one, my plan over the next two weeks is to basically watch it like much of the rest of the world and hope that it comes back. So at least that way I could get some swing setups to work with in the early portion of next year. But to my eyes, there's not a lot of tradable opportunity on this thing um, because we are flexing down to that fresh. Yeah, we're at a fresh yearly low now. You know, one thing that might be helpful or possible for those that are looking at reversal plays is to throw on a Fibonacci extension to see if something comes in at like the 27.2 extension. That one syncs up fairly well with a prior swing high around the 22K psychological level. You know, maybe something like that to try to play a deep discount reversal or something along those lines. Uh, S&P 500 might actually be a bit more constructive. We're testing through a big level right now. This is the 50% marker of the post-Trump move. I'm taking the election night low, drawing that up to the uh, October 3rd high. But that 50% marker that is being tested through right now, if we do see a close above that level, indicating a, a downside wick probing below that level, then there might be some reversal plays that I could work with going into that last week of the year. But until then, caution is the name of the game. And there's just not a whole lot of, of, of directional bias that I could pull off of either of these markets at the moment. Uh, my case is largely the same. If I want to look for equity weakness, I'm probably still going to be doing that in Europe until something changes. That 618 retracement that I pointed out to you a couple of days ago has come back into play. It's around 10,569. And I think the next move there uh, or the next level to look out for is that 10 flat psychological level. Last in play around the presidential election 2016. And as you can see right here, we're just holding that line right now. All right, that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to start taking some questions. Let me know what's on your mind. Yeah, and so Pete with a really good point here. One note of divergence from dollar weakness is dollar CAD as it broke above that 135 level price last seen in June 2017. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, and I think I'd even pointed out that resistance that was sitting there um, in our last webinar, like right in there, like those swing highs, May, June 2017. Um, just feels real rich at this point. Love the trend, hate the price, need to let it pull back, clean itself up before I could get on board with it. But I mean, the trend has been undeniable. Even when we had that dollar weakness, uh, post FOMC, buyers held this thing up. And until that breaks, I have no inclination to expect it to do anything else. Um, now is the art of trying to actually trade this thing. We got a decent response off that 786 retracement. Notice it was a quick fleeting type observation, but it was certainly there. Enough so that if we got a retest back down towards that level with a hold of support there, that could keep the door open for topside setup, stop below that prior low. And if that gets stopped out, then just look for a deeper area, another tight stop. If that one holds, great. If not, take a quick loss and then look forward to finally settle into some area of support. But this one seems like it's had both forces working, dollar strength, CAD weakness. And whenever I can get something like that going, I usually want to stick on it as long as I can. 
uh, Mr. Richard Heath. Good question. And sorry, I didn't have that chart a bit more dressed up. It, it's kind of emblematic of my uh, opinion on the Dow at the moment. But Mr. Heath asks, uh, hello, how do you see the FIB on the Dow now? I make Dow below its low. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so it is. Yeah, we're at, we're at fresh yearly lows, fresh 2018 lows. This thing has just unfolded with force. But when I get in that situation, it's time to redraw some charts. Let's clean this up a bit. You see that big, nasty red bar? I mean, I can't remember the last time a monthly printed like that. Since, yeah, since all the way back here. But it looks like this thing has just fallen out of bed. The Fibonacci retracement that I looked at on that S&P 500 look uh, was basically, again, just taking the November 2016 election night swing low. Draw that up to that October swing high. Uh, the area that I was looking for previously was right around 22K. Uh, it's 22,200. So, I mean, it's it's a bit further away. But the 50% marker of that, that post-election, that Trump move, that could remain of interest. Um, but right now it's a big, nasty red bar. I don't really have any wherewithal to be able to get long just yet. If it pulls back to find resistance prior support, you could look at short-term momentum strategies or something of that nature, but that's not really something that's heavy on my radar at this point. Uh, outside of that, reversal sets off the 50% marker of the post-election move. It's about the best that I got. This is not something I want to be holding long into, uh, into the, the yearly open until something here changes. Uh, from Mr. Richard Walker, I'm a little late. What do you think of a bearish setup on Euro Yen going into next year? <laughs> my friend. So that's actually my trade of the year for next year. I was looking, and uh, these are going to be published, I think, within the next week or two. Uh, I've already written it, but I haven't yet. Uh, they haven't yet been published. But that was my thesis for next year, short side Euro Yen, looking for a big break down towards this 115 level eventually. Um, the backdrop that I was looking at was, was largely one furnished by Yen Strength. I do think that that BOJ money, money printing policy is going to come into further view now that the ECB has has ended bond purchases. I don't know that the that the BOJ is going to have the wherewithal to be able to continue going pedal to the floor on the QE front. Um, now, on that token, I didn't want to look at euro dollar weakness because the dollar felt very stretched um, uh, to the long side. It seemed as though there might be the path of least resistance looking at the short side of Euro Yen. And so that's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm working with for my trade of the year. So uh, I do like that idea. Now, as far as how to wait for or look for that breakdown, I mean, we're crossing below a pretty big level right now of 127.50. Psychological level that helped to hold this low in mid-November. Getting in a bit tighter. There you go. You can see where that Yen strength has continued to play through a bit. It looks like we're just now starting to see that range beginning to wobble, wobble, usually first step before it gives way. Um, but, you know, at this stage, maybe playing a small pullback, you know, because you see where there's a couple of different four hour bars here already indicating some support. But on a shorter term basis, a pullback to like a 112, uh, excuse me, 127.65 up to like a 127.75 area. Which we open the door for stops either above this level of 112, uh, 128.40 or this level around 128.60. I think that could keep the door open for continued short side in the pair. But I do like this one going into 2019. These trades of the year, they could be tricky because I mean, they're largely, I mean, you gotta incorporate fundamentals, right? And a lot of what I use on on, on direct trading decisions, techs, simply for risk reward purposes. Um, but when I'm looking at a year that, or when I'm looking at a trade for like a year long plus, type of time frame. I mean, we have to incorporate the fundies and 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 that's what really has my interest around the short side of Euro Yen. And that's what on the basis of Yen strength. <laughs> uh, from Pete, uh, note there's a gap to the 122.50 for Apple. I did call 150 into the year. If stocks get really ugly, we could see that gap. I would buy. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think this is a real interesting note on headlines and the way that they re, uh, respond to or get molded around price action. 
right? Because Apple has been the absolute darling of the stock market for about the last 10 years, ever since iPhone 1 came out. And, you know, we talked about this one on Tuesday. Uh, this thing has just absolutely fallen out of bed in Q4. I mean, it's like a light switch getting turned off from that 233 high all the way down. I mean, we're at 157 now. We've seen 25% of this thing just decapitated in, during Q4. I'm on board with Pete. I think that if looking for short-term strategies, I think that bearish momentum is something that could be worked with. It does feel as though we're a bit oversold at the moment, but uh, but long-term, I'd be looking to, you know, basically try to, and I hate to use this term, but uh, to pick up some bargains here in Apple. If we get down for like a 786 retracement or maybe even 886 retracement around 105, that's where this starts to become interesting just from a pure value standpoint. Um, and I'm talking about largely from an investment perspective because if I pick it up long at 105 and then this thing hits down to say 8850, I'm still okay holding long because this is a company that I like and that I think could bring long-term value to the portfolio. And I think that's where the rubber hits the road on these equity market sell-offs. Where do we get to a point with which bulls just can't watch it anymore and they want to step in uh, due to the perceived value that's there? I don't know that we're there yet on the indices, but, you know, Apple's gotten absolutely crushed. We're heading down towards fresh 2018 lows and a real strong bullish trend has turned into a real strong bearish trend. And if we get down to some of these nether regions and... Uh, probably look at that 127 from where that gap begins down to like i said around the 88 six fib retracement i don't want to catch that falling knife just yet but there could be something down there <laughs> uh, for patrick way is current downtrend for kiwi due to the poor 0.3% uh, GDP, 0.6% expected, and the risk-off sentiment favoring the yen as global stock uh, indices are mostly down this week. I mean, I think that stuff like that plays into it, but I, I don't I don't think that that's the singular factor as to why it's off. I mean, I think it plays into the collective backdrop, but you know, as 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 a, as a bigger determinant of that trend, I think the U.S. dollar strength is piped in of recent to go along with some of that softer Kiwi data. I think that's what's playing through. From Pete, uh, Fed pulling stimulus into your closing positions. Fear all points to stock lower, in my opinion. Yeah, it's not it's not an easy backdrop to go and buy in lows, you know, especially when half of Wall Street's about to go away for holiday. It could be a tough, tough environment to be looking for something like that. Uh, for Patrick McKenna. Hi, James. So long in against the rest. Thanks. Well, it depends. I think there's still, you know, an important quotient of picking spots. Um, I like it specifically against the euro. Also like it against the US dollars. We go into 2019. I don't know how long that theme might play, though. Um, but I, I do think yen strength could remain as a dominant theme as we go into 2019, particularly if this this scenario of risk aversion continues to, to, to show through as it has been uh, throughout Q4. I mean, I'm not one of these these folks that's going to sit here and just, you know, throw barbs at the Fed. I think that's a kind of a cheap play. You know, at the end of the day, it's not one person at the Fed that's making these calls. It's a collective decision. It's a bank. That risk is spread. But, you know, to me, it does seem as though something has shifted in Q4. And to my eyes, it's undeniable. Because we went from this really strong, rip-roaring rally in Q3 to pretty much the exact opposite. And nothing's been able to hold the lows yet. Now, is the Fed wrong? We won't know that until we have enough historical data to be able to say it. But uh, it does feel as though this is where the global economy could use a bit more softening in the backdrop, if you will. Now, the Fed's been really responsive with that in the past. So I think if we did see this equity, quote unquote, correction, potential bear market continue into 2018. I think this is something where we will eventually see the Fed shift. But, you know, again, I just don't have any evidence of that taking place just yet. It's got to work with the charts that uh, that are in front of me and, and, until that cleans up. Uh, but I do think yen strength correlates nicely with those themes of risk aversion continuing.
All right, from Gerald Smyther. Uh, could you describe the entry technique you use to get long or short? You talk about levels to pull back to, but if price does not pull back to a level, what triggers your trade? Uh, yeah, I've got a full article here for you that goes over the whole way I approach markets. It's simple. It's called the four hour trader. And this is basically what I'm going to be doing over the next two weeks as I don't have a ton of extra time to be watching charts paint. But I'll look at charts at a pre-fixed interval. It makes it a little easier for me to make apples to apples comparisons. Um, prices aren't always going to hit exactly at my support or resistance levels, but that four hour close is pretty key for me because that gives me a recently closed wick on uh, a chart time frame of, of, of a decent amount to be able to make some adequate trading decisions. Um, for me in New York, these four hour candle closes are 591, 591, 591, 591, 591. I got that drilled in my head so that five o'clock hits, whether it's AM or PM, open up my platform, whether it's on my phone or if I'm nearby one of my computers. And then that's where I'll do a, a trip around the house, look at USD pairs and see where I might be able to react. Now, if I do have the time, this is what I'll do. I'll use this and basically trying to thread the needle a little bit um, by using an even shorter term variant uh, using a momentum trading strategy. Because the way I look at it is if I'm looking to get long up off of a support bounce and if I have the available resource to be able to go down to a five minute chart, wait for that to paint through, then I could get the probabilities in my favor, maybe just a little bit more, more attractively. But I go over both of those strategies in uh, each of those articles that I just shared. Let me make sure I get that one in the chat box. There we go. So I have both of those in the chat box. Uh, from Pete. James, my friend, I'm out the door for business, but I'll be in touch. Thanks for all you do. Pure gold consistently. Oh, that's too nice, my friend. LDHF, really, really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, certainly, Gerald. My pleasure to help. Um, all right, let's go back because I think there was a couple questions earlier that I missed. From Mr. Ryan Little, uh, did you look over Pound Yen? No, sir, I didn't. Um, and I'm sorry to say I don't really have a great look at that pair or a great view on that pair at the moment. Uh, this is one of those where I'm stuck on the sidelines without much to do for now. Um, this thing squeezed down towards that 140 psychological level. You know, maybe there's a support play in there around 140, 140 and a quarter. Did a pretty good job of catching these lows back in mid-August. But, you know, the last decent thing that I had on this one was something I looked at in the webinar last week, and that was res this resistance test off 143.79. That came through as pretty attractive, but the shorter term I get, the more more oversold it feels. So I just don't have the wherewithal to do anything on this one right now. Maybe, possibly, a 140 support bounce. But, you know, you see the way that that support came into play. Right? It touches it. We revisit. Bears are like, nope, get back there. Follow through support, support, and then bulls were able to take it away. I mean, it took a couple of days for that support to build in, four days even. Um, that'd be about the best that I got on the pair right now. <laughs> Marina Cardoso says, you make it so simple and clear. Thanks for sharing your view. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to state for the record, I do not think the trading is simple. Um, I think on its face, it's it's a pretty complex endeavor, you know, especially if we're trying to predict. But I think what can make it simple is looking at it from a perspective of humility, which is at the end of the day, the future is unpredictable. It, it's undeniable that that's the case. Um, and on that front, we just published this piece, basically set up for the holidays for folks that do want to get a bit better or a bit more experienced with technical analysis. And I just published this about an hour before the webinar started. But I think this is a resource that could help out for folks that are looking to get um, more ingratiated with technical analysis. And I've included work from myself, uh, the Daily Effects Trades of Successful Traders, which was authored by David Rodriguez. Um, we have Forex University in there. 
There's my price action stuff. Mr. Michael Boutros with his Foundations of Technical Analysis series. Great, great series. Paul Robinson, Becoming a Better Trader. And then, of course, our own Jeremy Wagner with his Elliott Wave work, which uh, you know, there should be something for for any type of trader in here, whether it's a fundamental trader just looking to get their risk management set up a bit more appropriately. But I'm going to put this in the chat box for anybody so interested. All right, got to take over the last couple questions of the day. <laughs> Gerald with the key point here, simple and easy are two different things when it comes to trading. Yes, sir. It's simple to lose a lot of money, right? <laughs> it ain't easy, though. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sorry, Brian. I saw this one come in a bit earlier, but uh, kind of ran through on a few other things. Is it possible to have a look at oil, too, please? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm in a similar spot there as I am with stocks. You know, it's it's put in one of those those headline moves that everyone's talking about. But I don't really have a backdrop that looks attractive on either side of this thing, at least at the moment. All right, so weekly chart, you can see where this thing has just absolutely unfolded in Q4. And, you know, this runs really similar to what happened on the 2016 Open. You know, it was a deeper fall, but started June 2014. And then as we opened it to 2015, it was like, uh oh, guys, something something's wrong with oil. Something is not good here. Now, for a long time, lower oil prices were considered to be a stimulus or, or, or an item of strength for the American economy, largely because the U.S. imported oil practically forever. Um, more recently, the U.S. has become one of the top producers of oil and is now a net exporter. And there's a lot of jobs in the U.S. that are based on energy extraction. And so the question that I was asking back in 2015, and this is something that still persists in my mind, it's, it's, it's has that relationship flipped? Is, uh, are we in a spot, particularly in the U.S., where lower, lower oil prices are now an economic risk to the backdrop? And I think that could be the case. Now, the big fa factor of fear in 2015 that we had was leverage within banks that were exposed to oil companies, whether it be extractors, drillers, et cetera. And so as oil prices were getting crushed lower and as those extractors, as especially those shale extractors, were, were seeing oil prices below break even, I mean, it was literally like a pain chain. You know, the more they drilled, the more they lost. The more they lost, the less likely they were to pay their debt the more trouble those banks were in. Now, that OPEC deal really seemed to help early 2016. Oil prices started to come back to life. But more recently, it started to fall out of bed again. Um, so on a fundamental front, I want nothing to do with this because this is one of those headline-driven deals where we're just waiting for OPEC to come out with some good news, at least good news for, for oil or oil bulls. On a technical basis, we're at that level of interest, 23.6 Fibonacci retracement of that major move that started all the way back in May of 2014. Let me tidy this up a little bit, get it exactly where it's supposed to be. There we go. High 108.10 set in 2014, low February 2016. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 618 did a great job of catching that high. I don't think the 23.6 has yet come into play. I mean, we barely, barely missed it. I mean, we're talking like, I think it's about seven cents. 145.40, 145.50, yeah, about seven, six, seven cents away from those lows. You know, when there's a support level like this, it's just kind of teasing the lows. What You know, one thing that could work out is an item of capitulation, as in see if sellers are able to just tip their toe in the water long enough for buyers to come back and say, get get back here, pulling price up, leaving an elongated wick underneath that support level. At that point, I might be able to look at some reversal setups, but until then, I needed to clean its act up before I'll be able to do anything. Uh, short side of the move, I'd probably not want to get short until we came back, until we came back towards that 50 handle. Probably wouldn't want to get short again. That feels like a trap right in there around 48. So I'd let that just blow right through and see if I could catch something up here around 50 flat.
All right. Uh, the last question of the day from uh, Mr. Russ Johnson. James, I've been watching for 96 hours, a dollar CAD and CAD yen. Uh, when dollar money buys dollar CAD, money sells CAD yen, period, tick for tick. Can you explain why? Uh, when money buys USD, money equally buys yen, tick for tick. Please explain. Thank you. Um, let me parse through this. Dollar CAD and CAD yen. Okay, so I mean, it sounds like there's a. So first off, for the tick for tick part, that that part I'm not going to be able to explain because I'm not of the belief that markets are perfectly aligned like that. You know, maybe it pops up over an observed period, and maybe even it holds for a little while, but. You're in essence looking at a pairing dilemma, right? Because dollar CAD, we have CAD as the counter currency in this pair. CAD yen, it's the base. So like, let's just say, for instance, the U.S. is closer for business and Japan's closer for business. And the only economy here that's open for business is Canada. And all day, Justin Trudeau, he's tweeting. He's tweeting good economic things. He's tweeting bad economic things. So that's going to get priced into both dollar CAD and CAD yen, but it's going to show in opposite directions because of the composition of each of those pairs. Because CAD's the base and CAD yen, it's the counter in dollar CAD. Now, again, from my experience, the way I look at markets, I don't believe that it's ever going to come in perfectly tick for tick. But it is certainly possible that if we are seeing CAD drivers get priced into the equation, that it is going to show in a divergent manner just based on the composition of those pairs. Uh, there is also the prospect of what's often called or looked at as triangular arbitrage. So let me explain. CAD yen is basically just the combination of dollar CAD and dollar yen, right? So if we're going to see a move in dollar yen, then that should be explainable by the constituents of dollar CAD and CAD yen. As in, if I want to trade dollar yen without actually touching dollar yen itself, I could take, like, say, a long dollar CAD and then a long CAD yen, right? So the short exposure that I have in long dollar CAD is canceled out by the long exposure that I have in CAD yen. And the net result is that, um, that I'm long the dollar by that dollar CAD setup. I'm short. Well, I'm, uh, short the yen by that CAD yen setup. And so I am. Theoretically, at that point, trading the Canadian dollar, but I'm canceling out those exposures through the two crosses. Now, I don't know if that perfectly answers your question, Russ, um, but if you have a follow up, feel free to throw it my way. I, I am going to be ending the webinar soon, so feel free to hit me up on Twitter. I don't know when I'll be able to get to it, but I'll do my absolute best to get back with you in a timely manner. And I may not be able to explain it because I don't always have answers. At least I hope not. I don't want to sound like one of them know-it-alls, but uh, I'm available there on Twitter, and I'll certainly do my best to help you out where I can. Uh, and in closing, I just want to take this last comment from Mr. Brian Head. Uh, thank you. And also thank you very much for your help through these webinars, James. Very helpful. Much appreciated. Have a great Christmas and Happy New Year. And I wanted to share that with everybody else in the room because I want to wish every one of you a happy Christmas and a very Merry New Year. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure getting to do these webinars with you. And uh, I do have one more before the end of the year. I'm going to be going next Thursday, 1 o'clock. I uh, hope you have the time to visit with me. And then after that, it's time to turn the page into 2019 and to Wash, rinse, repeat, and do this all over again. But thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.